Hello, my name is Ruzba Masari, and I'm this week's host of Inside America. Hi, I'm Arash Arabasadi. And I'm Tala Hadavi. We're two of the video journalists that VOA sent to cover the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, one of the largest natural disasters to ever hit this country. In a little while, we'll introduce you to two other VJs. Greg Flake is from Houston, Texas, and Adam Phillips from New York City. VJs, or video journalists, is the modern era's version of a reporter. We do it all. We shoot, we edit. We write, we produce. And we find all our own stories. And sometimes we're lucky enough to get in front of the camera and talk about what we do. And this is what we carry with us on the road. Because we never know if we're just going for a shoot or to produce an entire show. Obviously, we carry a camera with us everywhere we go. Tripods and lots of light. A laptop to be able to edit our story, digitize our footage, and to be able to write the script. And even all this isn't the hardest part of the job. That's to find the story, especially when we're going on a road trip like this, where we have no idea what access we will have and what stories we will find. Guys, can you believe this is where our house ended up? That whole life is gone. Look over this way. Look where Daddy's boat ended up. And in, in that debris is our living room furniture. I found the, our bedroom furniture and your toys over here. And the hot tub is like three blocks away that way. And this is, this is our boat that was parked in our driveway. This is our deck. This is a piece of it. Ten days ago, Lori Argentina and her family were forced to evacuate their beachfront home in Union Beach, New Jersey. Today, she returned home to find it in pieces. The storm surge just took everything and it's all gone. We lost it all. We flooded out, moved, the house moved about how many feet? 200 feet or so. It was wiped out off the foundation. The foundation crumbled. We just... We had everything, and it's just all gone now. More than 200 families in Union Beach also lost everything. It is one of the hardest hit towns in the state. No one in this town was untouched. And now, this small community is joining forces. Neighbor helping neighbor. Has, um, it's good in and one third less sugar, which is great. Yeah, it is. Take as many as you need. At the police station, many gather to offer assistance to each other. Here, I grew up here all my life. My parents still live there, my sister. We Wendy and Thomas Johnson hid on the second floor of their home as the storm was coming. It was just going blah, 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 and it just kept coming and coming for hours. They are now renting a trailer to live in until things get back to normal. The hurricane has left a mark on the young couple. My dad passed away on August 10th, and I took it from here on hospice, and um, he built me this house. And he built all this. He, from the bottom up, he helped with everything, and to have it ripped all out, it's ripping out my heart. It will not be easy to put these houses and these lives back together. The 6,000 permanent residents of this town have been forever changed by Hurricane Sandy. Take it one day at a time, I guess, and just try and see what we can work out. 
and everyone here agrees life here will never be quite the same. Tala Hadavi for VOA News, Union Beach, New Jersey. In our next story, we're going to meet with Greg Flakis, our Houston correspondent. He's been covering news for VOA for a long time. Hi, Greg. How you doing? Quite good. How are you? Good. Uh, you've been covering natural disasters for a very long time. How is this very different from anything else you've covered in the past? Well, I covered hurricanes here in the Gulf Coast and uh, also in other countries, and I've covered earthquake disasters in uh, Latin America. So I have a, a lot of points of comparison. The bigger problem from this storm, really, was that it knocked out power and many basic services to an area where you have a big concentration of population and it's also a very important place for uh, financial uh, business, For it has ports, it has uh, infrastructure that uh, the whole nation relies on. Great, thank you Greg. Let's watch your story from Staten Island. Along Staten Island's oceanfront for several blocks in from the shoreline there are piles of trash mounting in front of homes and businesses devastated by floodwaters. And I don't know if they will or not, right. but the fastest way to do it is to prove that your insurance won't cover it. Workers from the Federal Emergency Management Agency known as FEMA are providing displaced people with temporary shelter and explaining procedures for filing claims. State and local officials are also providing assistance. Government help is arriving here on Staten Island but many of the victims are being aided by their neighbors, their friends, and their family. People who lost homes can find a free meal at this food truck, normally operated in Manhattan, by hometown entrepreneur Dominic Tissorero. So I'm a native Staten Islander, and I, I definitely felt the need to uh, reach out to the, the community. Yeah. Most people on Staten Island did not suffer devastation and they're donating tons of food, clothing, and other items to the people who did. 16-year-old Corey Reddle and his soccer club friends collected donations. It, it hurts, you know, inside. My stomach's in a knot thinking about it and stuff. Living in New Dorp, living with all the people, all my friends, you know, houses got ruined and stuff. Help is also pouring in from other parts of New York and nearby states. That's a welcome sight for people like Damon Rosario, a local artist whose ground-level apartment filled with water when the storm struck. This is uh, uh, the first water line. You see it, it comes up to my neck. That, that's where the water came up to in my house. It goes all the way down. Rosario lost all his furniture, appliances, clothes, and precious mementos, including some family photos and childhood artwork. All my early stuff that from when I was growing up, my first experiences with art, my first things that I did, they're, they're, they're all gone. They're all gone. Too small? That's, I mean, that's too big, fine. right? Yeah, Damon Rosario has a place to stay with relatives and clothes to wear thanks to these women bringing him donations from a nearby church. He says this disaster has provided both grief and inspiration. Right now, if you look around the neighborhood, you're seeing the, the best and the worst of, of what can happen to people. You know, people are here helping and that's the best, but there's also people that are at their worst. They lost every article of clothing they have, every, all, all their possessions, all, all, their, all their things, and, and some people lost their lives. Recovery for people like Damon Rosario will take many months, but the way will be eased by the charitable spirit of friends and neighbors in this close-knit community. Greg Flakus, VOA News, Staten Island, New York. Arash, we have seen a lot of personal loss because of this massive storm. What's the estimate damage to the region? Bruce, we're looking at no less than $50 billion worth of damage to the region, and that's in all manners of infrastructure, from the subways to the roads to power lines and gas lines. It's all been ripped out of the ground, and the federal government is responsible for paying for that repair. Now, folks in the region saw this storm coming, and yet some people still refuse to leave their homes. Let's meet Taya Anderson. It was forecast as one of the largest storms in American history, and yet some New Jersey citizens still stood their ground. Mandatory evacuation, by the time it came in, unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of options. That's because Taya Anderson and her husband had waited too long. Everybody was begging us to get out, like our families. Oh, my husband's family in Ohio was like screaming at us and hanging up on us, like, get, get out, get out. But then she heard the hurricane was speeding up, which meant less time for the storm to do damage. The only crash we heard of the whole night was the first table falling over. After that, the water just sort of gently mixed it all around and 
you know, made a big hodgepodge of stuff. We knew the house wouldn't fall at that point. We'd made it through the worst of it. But thousands of others didn't. They lost their cars, their furniture, and even their homes. But Anderson says... It's just stuff. It's so stupid. But everybody lost so much more. So many, like, photos and memories and stuff that you can never, ever get back. That's, that's going to be hard. Ours was really just furniture. It was stuff. It doesn't mean anything. She says what does matter is how people pulled together. This is a community. This is a town. This is a town that cares about other people. and sticks together and everyone pulled through. Neighbors helping neighbors. Anderson says that's common here. As soon as somebody, somebody got hot water and they had showers, they'd put on Facebook, I have hot water, come take a shower. Still, Anderson can't help but look back at how lucky they were. We were worse than stupid. We were idiots. We took our, you know, we took our children's lives into our hands and I'll, I'll never do that again. Because next time, they may not be as lucky. From Monmouth Beach along the New Jersey shore, Arash Arbasadi for VOA News. Voice of America. 1,500 hours of news and information. Educational and cultural programming to more than 134 million people worldwide each week. Listen to us on radio. Watch us on television. Follow us on Facebook or Twitter. And through your mobile device. VOA. We're dynamic and consistent. In bringing you the most reliable information in 43 languages. Tune in. Tune, Tune in. in. There's no doubt that it's going to be a long time before this part of the country returns to normal. And as citizens return, they find that there's absolutely nothing waiting for them when they get home, except a helping hand. Two major storms in as many weeks have left much of the region in ruin and despair. But one thing that has not been destroyed is the positive attitudes of people living in the storm's aftermath. What else am I gonna do? My livelihood is underwater. It went underwater, you know, it's gone. But I'm, I'm trying to rebuild it. Chris Jacobs watched as Superstorm Sandy ripped through the restaurant his grandmother built in the 1930s. Yeah, we'll rebuild this town. You know, it's not, it's, it's been here for years. It's not going to go anywhere now. And while he cleans up and waits to rebuild, Jacobs and others like him have made it their mission to help feed those who've come to help their town. Everything is destroyed. It's not like you can go across the street and get a sandwich, a burger, or a glass of Coke. It's just not happening. That's Christopher Wood, the owner of a restaurant called Woody's. His shop sits next to the local fire company, and now he's part of the effort to feed the many relief workers and first responders who have come to lend a hand. What I did is I reached out to you know the people that I know and, and pulled all the resources I could together in order to get the Army National Guard, for example, to get the resources I need to feed this town. And it's come together remarkably well. Right now, we're really just out here to support the community, support the towns, and support the people that have lost pretty much everything. Today, that means helping empty truckloads of supplies. All that food goes to feed out-of-town relief workers. Whenever the place is clean, they, they don't need me anymore, that's when we'll, you know, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. I'm always optimistic, that's uh, my nature. Uh, yes, it's just gonna take an incredible uh, long period of time. I, I have no doubt in my mind that we will rebuild and be back as a town. While Hurricane Sandy washed much of the town's physical structures away, the spirit of the locals remains strong and the rebuilding has already begun. Arash Arbasadi for VOA News, Seabright, New Jersey. Arash, there's obviously a lot to remember from this trip. What sticks out to you the most? Tyler, I'm never going to forget that it was voting day 2012, and I waited a good hour and a half to cast my vote for the President of the United States before getting in the car and driving four hours to New Jersey. What about you? Well, I remember it was the last day, and we had been working 20 hours a day for a few days straight, and I was exhausted, but I was really committed to finding a really heartfelt story. I want to really tell the story about loss. And I had been driving around a few different towns, and you could see how this community had come together. They were like a big family now, and those that had lost everything to those that had lost nothing. They were like just coming together, finding support in each other. Everything inside is all gone. Everything is gone. A week has passed since Hurricane Sandy ruined Julia Stone Villa's home. She's been preparing for this new storm with her son Joe. They paid the price for not doing so last time. Gone. And all the cards I had from the 50s, they're, they're done. Just done. Just completely done. Many neighbors had similar experiences. Some lost everything. But one house was barely touched, not even evacuated. And we went to sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning, and 
I went to sleep thinking, well, when we get up in the morning, there's going to be a couple inches of water in the house. But I got up about four, and to my amazement, there was no water in any place. Well, the homes are empty now, so it's, it's no big deal. With this coming storm, John and Cheryl will have to leave. The mayor issued a mandatory evacuation. People are scared, and they, they do know that they have to get out. They can't take, they have to take it seriously. They have barely recovered from one disaster, and another may be on its way. But Wendy says Superstorm Sandy taught them one thing. It was amazing how the community came together. I mean, I think that's, that's what touches you the most, is that so many people just came out to help and, and not ask any questions. There isn't much property left to damage in brick but officials hope the mandatory evacuation will save lives. Tala Hadavi for VOA News, Brick, New Jersey. One thing I never thought about, one thing I don't think anybody thinks about, is that the first responders who come to help in times of crisis live in these communities themselves. Who's helping them? It's hard to imagine when you look at this that much of Long Beach Island on the New Jersey coast looks like this. Lynn Schnell was one of the lucky ones. She only had half a meter of water in her home, but the house is still standing. Her son Chuck is a police officer in Long Beach Township. Their family service to this community runs deep. My father was a volunteer firefighter for 30-something years, worked for my police department for 42 years, and <clears throat> unfortunately he passed away last year. So, this really helps. They're helping out all the fire or the policemen that are working to help, to help everybody else. So they're helping the fire policemen with their houses. And this is what I have, and I can't be more thankful and grateful. It's pretty special, isn't it? Yeah. When these types of things happen, people forget that the first responders that live here also lost their homes and also had a lot of damage and family members they have to take care of. And unlike the rest of the residents, they're unable to do that because they're still responsible for keeping the peace and taking care of the residents here. So we come up to take care of them. The Fraternal Order of Police is the largest organization in the world representing police officers. And it's that organization that sent help from across the country. It gives them a chance, maybe they can get a little break and check on their property and uh, be able to help them out as much as we can. So it, it feels really good. I brought a dozen officers from Florida. Some of them are uh, active duty officers, some are retired. Myself, I'm retired, but uh, our objective is to help the officers that live in this community because they're on the street protecting their community. And we have a tradition of uh, cops helping the cops. Police helping police is special for everyone involved. You help your everyday citizen every day, but when you help another cop, that feels really good. In Louisiana, we've had the opportunity to serve with others who, um, through Katrina and Rita, uh, who came down to help us, so it's a privilege to come up here and to help them out to re return a favor. For Chuck Schnell and his mother, the helping hand comes from those who share their pain, those who've weathered storms while serving their own communities, those men and women serving their fellow police officers. From Long Beach Island, New Jersey, Arash Arabasadi for VOA News. When everything is broken, when the power lines and the phone lines are down, how do you inform your residents? How do you inform family and friends about your safety? Social media. I found that even in the small towns of New Jersey, a tweet was not just a tweet. Hey, sir. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. The National Guard has set up checkpoints and no one is allowed into Seabright, including the town's 1,500 year-round residents. Information is at a premium. Thank God for Twitter. When the storm first hit, we really operated this borough on our smartphones, a borrowed iPad and one landline telephone. And so at first, Twitter was really the only way that I had to communicate what was going on. So thanks to Twitter, um, people who never even heard of Twitter before are, are now following. And it's really been a useful way to get accurate information out to people about what's happening here, what um, FEMA can do for them, where they can find FEMA, where they can find su supplies and food and a change of clothes, a, sh a charging station for their devices. And it's also been a great way for people who want to help Seabright because we've been able to communicate the things that we need on the ground, like plywood or 
hot dogs or um, you name it. John Ekdahl, the mayor of neighboring Rumson, also says social media has been a big help. Volunteerism has been just extraordinary. Um, it all started through uh, social media and we didn't put any signs up, no phone calls. Within two hours of putting out the fact that we needed food and clothing for the people that have been displaced, we literally had an auditorium full of food and clothing. In fact, we collected so much that we had more than Rumson residents could use and we moved some of it to across the bridge where we'll go into Seabright and some up to the Bayshore area which was also a hard hit. As some of the towns hit hard by Superstorm Sandy have found, social media has quickly become a very valuable tool in the ongoing effort to get back to normal. Tala Hadabi for VOA News, New Jersey. We'd barely even gotten to New Jersey to see the damage that Hurricane Sandy had done there, and then they got hit with another storm. Residents of the Jersey Shore town of Rumson had barely recovered from Superstorm Sandy when the next storm hit. Oh, no, not a good time and we're, we've all kind of had enough of this and uh, now we're getting socked with another one. Despite the pounding wind and rain here, this community keeps pulling together. We are really pleased with uh, all the turnout and it's, it's exhausting. I don't think anybody could have predicted that we would have had this level of quality and quantity of uh, donations and volunteers. Jennifer Wargo Sapnar helped organize this comfort station. It's here that people impacted by the storm can find anything from household cleaners to clothes. But some need more than that. We've been able to cover um, all of their needs in terms of uh, food, clothing, and a place to stay. The next crisis we're facing because we've condemned probably 50 homes here in Rumson and, and many more across the river is where their longer term uh, living situation is going to be. This new storm is making the situation worse. Um, the water is already coming up. We're afraid that this storm is going to undo all of the progress that we made this week. Personally, I'm nervous that this storm is going to do uh, even more damage to what Sandy left behind. And some of these first responders haven't even had the chance to deal with what Hurricane Sandy has done to their own homes and families. It's the job. It's the job. But as chief, i got to worry about my guys getting home to see their families, which they have not really done, and take care of their houses, which they have not really done. For them, being on the front line of an ongoing disaster in the neighborhood means coping with tragedy, both professionally and personally. Arash Arbasadi for VOA News, Rumson, New Jersey. One of the other reports that we got was from VOA's own Adam Phillips, who is actually in New York City. Adam, take me back a little bit when you first went out there and started doing some reporting. Well, it was uh, quite dramatic. And the first thing I thought of was Katrina, because it was a kind of a quality that we weren't in ordinary time, and that somehow something big and cataclysmic and even bigger than New York City had just happened to us. Adam Phillips, thank you so much for being with us today. Let's take a look at one of the spots that Adam produced in New York City the days after Hurricane Sandy. This close-knit seaside neighborhood is a few kilometers away, but seemingly a world apart from Manhattan. It was nearly decimated by the storm. Crazy. No more boardwalks, stores being robbed, everybody starving, everybody looking for something to eat, clothing, heat, light, nothing out here. Residents say that city and emergency services have neglected them. They're just buying past us, the National Guards. They're going all the way down here. They're going here. They're setting up generators. They're buying past my building right here. They're not telling us what time the buses stop. People need to get to work. We have no way to get home because the bus stops at 5 o'clock. The cops are not telling us anything. And the building, they have no water from the 10th floor up. They can't flush the toilets. They can't bathe. We need help over there. Possessions and bits of shattered homes lie scattered and rotting on every street, waiting to be carted away. Whole sections of the boardwalk, the heart of Rockaway, are destroyed. But residents are resilient and resourceful. Cooking food over an open fire every day. We have a solar power uh, charging station for people's phones. And uh, just trying to, trying to support the community we live in and, and make sure that everybody's okay and stays okay. Donations have been pouring in from the community and other parts of the city. And as the weather turns cold, warm clothing is needed. Drinking water is also in demand. D, these are C. I got it, I got it. This local business has become a community center for receiving and sharing supplies. Like, 
my heart is overflowing. It's, it's truly amazing the way that people respond when they ask for it, and people really do actually care about the Rockaways now, you know? I mean, it's, it's emotional, definitely, you know? But patience and strength are running thin. I'm not really angry, but hey, it's getting there. Nearly a week after the storm, residents of the Rockaways say that they hope that their community will be remembered and redeemed. Adam Phillips, VOA News, New York. Thanks for watching Inside America. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Till next time.